Thy zombie takeout remains steadfast. Thy zombie takeout remains constant. Thy zombie takeout remains righteous. Welcome to episode 222 of Zombie Take Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie Cult Movie Podcast. I'm Uncle John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got a little bit of listener submitted. Danny Meeks posted on Google Plus in reference to the trailer, saying, I'm looking forward to this. And after what you posted on the trailer on Facebook, I am too. Because this is going to be an interesting review. Um, and without further ado, let's get straight to that review. This week's movie being from 1966, Man of the Hands of Fate. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Incompetence. It's not always a bad thing. And also brought to you by Mike's. When you make a film, for fuck's sake, <laughs> use at least one microphone. Yeah. All but right. They used one just after the fact. <laughs> that, that, that is true. I did not even think of that. Oh, okay. So we have this uh, uh, kind of uh, American couple... I I don't know, wouldn't say they were young, kind of middle. Yeah. You know. He is at least kind of middle aged. Yeah. Yeah. Married married way over his head, way younger. <laughs> and uh they are on vacation I don't know where exactly where they are planning on going, but they're going somewhere on in the middle of nowhere. They wind up getting lost, uh, stumbling upon some bizarre cult where they decide where the at least the father decides you know what we'll stay the night here <laughs> they uh they go into the this house they they discover that it's some weird black magic thing going on uh they make a couple attempts of trying to leave not very in earnest though oh the car doesn't work we'll come back in and and wait around for something good to happen <laughs> uh then they one of them ex- tries to escape on foot, or I'm not sure exactly what the plan was. But uh, meanwhile, the uh, I don't know if he's a priest, demon, or whatnot. He is he wakes from his coma or whatever he was in, and his many wives wake up too. They get into one of the worst cat fights I've seen in movie on film. Mm-hmm. And then um, with a great score, <laughs> and then and then they uh, and uh, then they try to escape on foot, but um, this is only sixty-eight minutes long, so yeah. hilarity pretty much ensued from the beginning. I think this is the shortest movie we've reviewed so far. It could very well be, yeah. Not counting Destino, of course. Yeah. Up until now, I think Primer had it, but this is about ten minutes shorter than Primer. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. I forgot Primer was only about 70-something yeah. minutes. So it's, uh, it's, it's, hour 17, oh. specifically. Okay. This is an hour 8. Yeah. Now, this was written and directed and produced and starred Harold P. Warren, who played Michael, the father. And he was very active in the theater scene in El Paso and once had a walk-on role on the series Route 66, where he met screenwriter Sterling Siliphant. While chatting with Siliphant in a coffee shop, Warren claimed that it was not difficult to make a horror film and bet Selefant that he could make an entire film on his own. After placing the bet, he wrote the outline on a napkin. How much was bet, though? <laughs> doesn't say if there was any money involved. Um, okay. To finance the film, he accumulated a substantial but nevertheless insufficient $19,000 in cash, which, with inflation, would today be worth 138 grand, roughly. Now, that's about an upstream color budget. Well, right. That's, what, three times the amount of clerks or four times the yeah. amount of the original clerks? That's not real low. No. Relatively speaking, unless things yeah. were more expensive back then, which they weren't. No. No, they were not. Also, despite the film's failure in quite everything, Warren managed to win the bet. What? <laughs> because he was able to make an entire film on his own. Yeah, but... I... He, did, he never said it would had to be a good film. But that would mean you could just wave a camera at anything. And yeah. he could have won the bet. Yeah. That was a dumb bet on the other guy's part. Yeah. 
there needed to be some stipulations. He had to have, <laughs> what's the word that we were, tell a story perhaps? <laughs> well, there's a story. It, it's, it meanders, but there's a story. <laughs> now, getting into you know, your uh, sponsor. Yeah. The entire film is dubbed. It might as well have been a foreign film. Oh, yeah. Because they had no mics on set. So the actors had to come in and loop their dialogue. And it's just a hair off. It actually looks like a dubbed foreign film. Well, sometimes it, it synced up and sometimes it did not. Um, yeah, it came and went. My favorite parts, of course, were the parts where he originally wanted a line or the actor in the studio dropped the line. <laughs> so you have this extra bit of pantomime yeah. or lips moving or whatever. Well, speaking of dropping a line, the scene after Torgo tells them he doesn't know if they can stay and he doesn't know how the master would feel about it. There's a gap of about 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Where they're just kind of looking around, trying not to look at each other. Swear it feels like somebody dropped a line. Of course. And you brought up Turgo. Did you want to talk about the story of Turgo? I think that's... Well, the the um, appliance? Well, yeah, I guess it starts with the appliance. Well, just to explain before I get into this. Um, yeah. There was a wire apparatus he wore on his legs. In the film, it just makes him look like he has giant knees. Some have claimed that he wore it backwards and his character was supposed to be a satyr. It was supposed to mimic, you know, the hind legs of a horse that bend the other way. And it, it just looked like he had this weird walk to me. And it made him look like he had gigantic knees. Like he just did this weird shuffle kind of thing. And it was just kind of... And the fact that nobody commented on it in mm-hmm. the in the script or anything just... <laughs> It just made it all that more out there. Like what? Now, when you mention the story of Torgo, do you mean what happened to the actor afterward? Well, yeah. It's crazy to think that somebody lost their life because of this film. Well, not not directly. Um, the apparatus caused severe damage to his knees. He was basically in constant pain after, afterwards. And he ended up with a drug problem and killed himself. Yeah, I mean... When they said that, I was kind of like, oh, come on. You know, how could they have linked it back to this film? But he died in this year. Less than a year <laughs> after the movie was made. Yeah. Like, I think it said October of 66, he was dead. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> and I I think I remember it saying because of the knee damage. It's That's probably the most crazy thing we've seen on this, yeah. uh, on this whole show ever. Yeah, probably. But somebody pretty much wound up dying mm-hmm. for you want to say for their art no but it was for this it yeah. was for this crazy bet and he didn't even have to do it no. there was no call for it and in my opinion i think john reynolds was the actor's name yeah. played torgo he was the high point of the movie of course he was he was the best of the film no doubt his parts make it enjoyable for me and i will say i enjoyed the movie overall I got bored about, I'd say, 26 minutes in. I think a lot of it had to do with the dubbing, too. Mm. It was just too... <laughs> I kind of got used to that. You know, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an anime fan, so I, I'm used to dubs. So that didn't bother me. Uh, I did get a little bored in the non torgo scenes, though the master was entertaining in his own right. I was most disappointed with him. I was expecting a, you know crazy over the top mm-hmm. Jeffrey Combs. Ha, yeah. Instead we kinda got we kinda got a Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> yes. A yes. manic Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Who kind of looked like the bastard child of Freddie Mercury and Frank Zappa. I was thinking John Aston. Okay, yeah, I can see that too. Yeah. But but rolling back to the beginning, actually not necessarily the beginning throughout the movie. What was with the random cop scenes? First <laughs> he stops them on the way to the place to tell them they, their taillight is out, which has no bearing on the movie. And then he, he stops this couple in a car making out, seemingly, again, no bearing on the movie. Later, it comes back to that couple. Same cop stops them. And then they mention this couple who went somewhere they shouldn't, the, the, the main couple in the movie. Now, my interpretation of that is that was a glimmer of false hope <laughs> that there was the possibility that the cops would come and save them. And he kind of does dangle that out yeah, there yeah, true. a few times. And you're, when he comes back and the, the make out, making out couple actually brings up 
you know, that old family, you know, <laughs> why don't you go buy, you know, buy them. They, they went off down into like the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And you think, oh yeah, they're going to remember they pulled that family over with the tail lights out and put two and two together and come. And I'm sorry for spoiling this movie for you guys, but I mean, it's like 68 minutes long. <laughs> And you you might be thankful that we did. Well, <laughs> it depends on what if, you feel about the movie. I, true. I, I if like you want to watch the train wreck, you you don't need to know how it's going to end anyway to enjoy the train right, wreck. Absolutely, very true. <laughs> very true. The, the script is very optional on this. Uh, you you could know every beat of the movie; it's still going to be enjoyable or not, depending on your sensibilities. And it's not for the story at right. all. Right. Now, you mentioned the cops investigating. Uh, lighting was limited for the film, which explains the infamous scene in which two cops literally take two steps to investigate and then turn back. <laughs> because they didn't have the lighting to allow them to go any further. They even hear gunfire, and they're just like, oh, you know, wow. <laughs> what great cops uh-huh. who can't tell, you know, if something came across the border or if it came from right or, you know, nearby. Now, I forget if I said this on air or not, but last week I mentioned to you that I attempted to see this twice. Yes. Aside from watching it on Misty, MST3K. I was wrong, because this is not the film I was thinking of when I said that. Really? I don't know which movie I was thinking of when I said it. Um, it was set in a nightclub, again, 60s, black and white. I don't remember which movie it was. It wasn't Manus. In fact, there's an iOS game based on Manus that I have on my phone and I've played. It's It's kind of fun. <laughs> that while I enjoyed it, I, I didn't understand what it had to do with this movie that I remembered as Manos, because I saw the MST3K episode like 20 years ago and had forgotten all of what Manos was. So this was effectively like watching it for the first time. And I'm wondering when the um, the whole couple getting lost trope began. Hmm. Probably whenever horror began. <laughs> it was probably one of the first horror stories. Because, I mean, the structure of this and Rocky Horror, hence the title of this week's episode, mm. were just, uh, yeah. I mean, even the scene where where the priest is uh, waking up, yeah. you could really compare to, and even the damn robes, <laughs> pretty <laughs> similar to Tim Curry. Yeah, yeah. And I think the robes were probably my highlight of the film, actually. Mm-hmm. The giant fingered ropes. Should be mentioned that Manos is Spanish for hands, so it's hand, the hands of fate. Yes. And and um, the master's robe has two giant hands on it. Uh, Torgo's walking staff has a big hand at the top of it. It's like a James Brown style robe without the sequence. It's it's just it's it's breathtaking. If there is one thing you want to watch this movie for. It's got to be that. But I guess you could see that in the Mystery Science uh, Theater version. So, And you can find the MST3K version of Manos on YouTube, both for free and for $3, depending on how you want to go about that. Now, we were talking about how, you know, Rocky couldn't necessarily have borrowed from this because who had seen it before oh, right. you know, it was on Misty? I think someone may have, because there's a dog attack scene in the movie with a lot of barking. And that barking sounds a lot like the barking in Been Caught Stealing by Jane's Addiction. Wow. Wait a minute. Are you are you serious? I, I don't know. I'm not saying they did sample it, but it sounds a lot like they could have. Most likely that's a stock sound. Probably, yeah. Which is also probably where Jane's got it from. Yeah. But it just made me think of Jane's Addiction, of that particular song. I hadn't heard that song in so long, so I, I guess I'd just forgotten about the sound. I haven't itself. heard it in ages either. It just I heard <laughs> that, and it, it put the song right into my head. You probably haven't heard it in 15 years. We mentioned that Torgo was the highlight of the movie, not just yes. because of, of John Reynolds. I mean, he really did commit to the point where it killed him. Yes, it's, it's just insane. But the character himself was probably one of the most interesting henchmen I've ever seen, because he's effectively just an Igor, a henchman. Right. But there is a ton of pathos. He is legitimately creepy. You know, he's not a throwaway character like most henchmen. Right. And yeah, I think this could have, uh, this would have been a lot more interesting if they had more of him in it. Mm. Or if he had played, 
I keep forgetting the the priest's name. <laughs> the master. The that's master. Why. I think that's it. Okay. I don't think they gave him a real name. I just called him the priest all the time, but you know. By the way, his fate is left open ended. Torgo, I'm talking about, because Warren thought he might do a sequel. So, wow. you know, at one point he has all of his wives supposedly kill Torgo by shaking him and slapping him. I'm not sure how that would work. <laughs> but then he lights his hand on fire. So, and then Torgo runs off. There was this, I mean, that whole sequence where he was just way too impressed with the idea of I'll put the camera on the ground pointing up and have the <laughs> women on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you really think this hasn't been done before, dude? <laughs> and you mentioned the scene where they try to get away on foot. And yes. they're stopped by a snake. <laughs> which Michael, the father, shoots. So they decide to go back to the murderous cult because there are snakes outside. Yeah. Oh, and the cat fight. We got to talk a little bit more about the cat fight. Now, remember we did we talked about one movie where a cat pie fight was entirely disappointing. Mm -hmm. But this, I'm not even sure what this was. It was four or five, maybe even six women in these white dresses beating the hell out of each other with music that sounded very early King Crimson. I would say it was more like a group of women having a mass seizure together. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, trying to make it look like they were hitting each other. Fair enough. But, oof. The music was what intrigued me, because it was straight up Crimson. With this cheesy cat fight scene. It was awesome. By the way, as the film dragged on and on, the increasingly disgruntled crew began to refer to the movie as Mango's The Cans of Fruit. <laughs> Just happened to notice that. And production didn't last long on this, though. No, no. I mean, it was only an hour eight. And I think I saw he had only rented his equipment, so he yeah. had to speed through this. Yeah, he had to shoot things as quickly as, quickly as, as possible. possible yeah. Which, of course, I mean, I have to give some credit for. <laughs> the fact that he pulled this all off without any training whatsoever. And only two people who worked on the film, uh, Jackie Neiman, who played the daughter, and the Doberman got paid. She got a bicycle, the Doberman got a bag of food. Nobody else got a thing. They were promised a cut of the profits, which, of course, were nothing. Not. But, I mean, if you're in community theater like these guys were, and someone's making a film locally. Okay, you're in. You're in. Like, uh, you know, yeah. you just, you're, you know you're taking your chances on it. Mm-hmm. And you just do it. You do yeah. it for the experience more than anything else. Right. So people bitching about how the, the the story was going along. Of course, it is a ridiculous story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy makes Ed Wood look like Merchant and Ivory. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I, I have to spoil the the ending. Okay. It might not really have been the end. Yes. But when... um. Torgo runs off. He was planning a sequel. And Nothing then, beats uh, the end with the question yeah, mark. He says the end with a question mark. <laughs> that That is probably the loudest I laughed throughout the entire thing. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Which very nicely brings us to sequels and remakes, if you're done with your notes. I believe so. Manos, the rise of Torgo. Quote, we'll be doing it because we love it, said Rupert Talbot Munch, the film's director. Rise of Torgo is the sequel. That's in the works. What? Uh, uh, director, writer, and producer, I should say, for uh, Rupert Talbot Munch. He also said, we're doing it on our own dime. We're doing it for the fun to see how far we can go. It's going to be a testament to the creativity and the craziness of all the people involved. You got to get Wizzo involved. <laughs> you have to get Wizzo involved. Munch will also be playing Torgo. He's done a couple of conventions as Torgo. And I think I remember reading that Jackie Neiman, who played the daughter, will be involved. They approached no her. shit. The plot would take place in the present, some 40 years after the original film. It was supposed to be released this year, so it's almost 50 years. He also said he plans to shoot the film at some of the original locations in El Paso, Texas, and include some of the original cast members. He also hinted at a major character actor who might be interested in joining the cast, but we couldn't confirm any identity. You gotta get Wizzo to play the master. Yes, That's yes. all there is to it. 
a mustache on Wizzo. Combs those, or Bruce. You put those robes on Wizzo, and, and you've got gold. You really do. They were planning to release it, as I said, this year, but according to IMDb, it still hasn't been released. But yeah, there's going to be a sequel to Manos eventually. It's in the works eventually to be released, probably straight to video. I'm really interested in seeing it. Now, if they just made this a silent film, would this have been better, you think? No, because I enjoyed a lot of the bad acting. I mean, it almost was a silent film, yeah. in part how heavy-handed the score was. It's true. You almost should have just gone all the way and just done, you know, them saying the lines. They were saying them over the top as it was anyway. Just have the... uh you know, the the placards come up to give more of a just... It would have cut down on the dialogue, and he could have told a simpler story, really. Mm -hmm. Since he is telling a very simple story as it is, it would have spared us the random repetition of lines, you know, to drive home plot points. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I don't know if the Master will approve. (laughs) You don't know if the Master approve? No, I do not know if the Master will approve. Sure, ruined by what have I learned. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> so, on to brains. On to brains. I really had fun with this, particularly for Torgo, but also a lot of the cheesy acting and, and over-the-top dramatics of it. I'm going for. I think it should be seen. Oof. It, I'd see the Misty version, but this... Uh, oof. <laughs> it, it's just too too slow to bear really it's like the longest 68 hours you will experience because the fact that you just said 68 hours <laughs> says it all really yeah. um and the the script is pretty weird um the subtext of it mm-hmm. and there is a subtext there oh we forgot to mention the interesting surprise at the end the daughter also becomes one of the master's wives and well, right when the film premiered a woman beat Warren with her purse because of that scene. <laughs> and and damn it, he should have been beaten for this, honestly. <laughs> but, I mean, his overall story, if you're looking at this, and I, I was trying to see if there was anybody else out there with me on this, because it's sort of, you could almost say it as like a, a statement on uh, chauvinism, in a way. Oh yeah, definitely. Because um, the you know, the American family where he isn't really wearing the pants all that much. You know, he's taking, like, you know, uh, guff from her. And yet here is this cult where the man is the ruler of them and, and has multiple wives. Uh, you know, there, there's different feelings about this online. Somebody was saying that it was also anti-Mexican, which I don't really think so. I don't see that. Yeah, I, I think that's a very much of a stretch. It, it takes place near mexico yeah, yeah. and that's just a part of the story i and I that was just for convenience right exactly that's just where they are for reals <laughs> um but saying that the cult is mexican too just doesn't make any sense but if you're looking at this at, at, from a feminist point of view mm-hmm. it's kind of <laughs> a nostalgic look at for the old ways i feel mm-hmm. you know how that if you know, a real man would be able to take all of them in and eventually does in the end. So it's it's kind of weird just yeah. to think of it that way. But yeah, I'm giving him half a brain because, well, this is really a student film and you can't be that harsh on it. Okay. And then I'm giving him half, another half a brain for the, uh, the robe mm-hmm. and another half for Torgo. So 1.5. All right. And what have we learned? We learned that if you put a flute to anything, it sounds like a Charlie Brown Christmas special. (laughs) And I learned that I am John. I take care of the place while the master is away. Nicely played. Until next time, when we'll be reviewing Pan's Labyrinth, it'll be our Halloween episode. Although you could argue we've done two weeks of Halloween with this one. Yeah, you know, it was funny when this was starting, I was saying, I kept waiting for something awful to happen, and I realized it had. The film (laughs) had started. (laughs) Until then, go to zombietakeout.com, check out the album art, the episode description, of course, the episode itself, which you're already listening to. Links to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and YouTube. Links to subscribe via RSS and iTunes. Please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. 
you also find the movie list, every movie we've reviewed so far, and every movie we are going to review, up through the first five weeks of next year, actually. Or six weeks, I think we put I put Buffy after the Resident Evil movies. Damn, that's planning. Which I just bought on DVD, so I'd have them. Wow. They're actually cheaper on, like, half the price on DVD than they are digital. It's It's weird. You also find the request form. If you've got a movie you'd like to hear us review, please leave it on the request form. And, of course, the recommendations list. Before watching it, I, I, I didn't think for a second that it would end up on the rec list. About ten minutes in, I was hoping. Unfortunately, it didn't quite make it there. It was just too slow <laughs> for 68 minutes for <laughs> hours. You can also email us, zombietakeout at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 414-368-ZTL1, or for the alphanumerically challenged, 414-368-9861. Always remember that you will always be calling from the middle of Milwaukee. And until next time, always remember to never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. you can see that in the mystery science uh, theater version so which well there's i forgot to pause the show i just want to check something oh i still have a browser open good i wanted to see if it was on netflix because they have a bunch of misty on there no such luck let me check youtube it is on yep it's Two copies of it on YouTube. Oh. And, yeah, well, I guess we'll mention that. I'm surprised they have a lot of Misty on Netflix right now. They don't have Madness, but they do have it on huh. YouTube. And you can find the... Back to the show.